236. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room, where Abishag the Shunammite was attending him. Bathsheba bowed low and knelt before the king. What is it you want? the king asked. She said to him, My lord, you yourself swore to me your servant by the Lord your God. Solomon your son shall be king after me, and, we will, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord the king, <clears throat> do not know about it. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calf, and sheep, has invited all the king's sons, Abathar the priest and Joab his commander of the army. But he has not invited Solomon your servant. My lord the king, the eyes of Israel are on you to learn for who he you will sit on the throne of my lord <clears throat> the king after him. Otherwise, as soon as my lord the king is laid to rest with his fathers, I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. Thank you, Jared. Sorry about all the hard names. What an exciting day. It's great to see all the Women with roses, moms that are here, that's always a good thing to be able to see and to celebrate and to remember, and uh, that's just an exciting time when families can get together, and uh, it's always a good thing. So, that's the first thing is Happy Mother's Day. How do you like it? I drew it. No, not really. I just found it. <laughs> I'm not that good. So there's a few things that are coming up that I wanted to let you know about. Um, one is going to be our Wednesday nights that we're going to be doing in the summer. So it's still a few weeks away, but uh, we've been doing our normal classes for things. And so coming up, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We've done this in the past, but uh, Michael Horton, who's been leading this morning, and Tricia Ubrig are going to be teaching us some new songs. And so... Coming up in June, they're going to take one of the weeks, and they know how to do this. So, guys, you could actually sound just like Michael Horton if you want to. He'll show you how to do that, and Tricia is just able to get such good sound out of people. Uh, and so that's going to be an exciting thing. But that's going to be an every other week alternate thing. So Joshua has planned some things with family on the other weeks, and so come and be surprised. If you can keep up with the alternating, that would be great. But uh, it's going to be a good summer with some of the things just all together in here and being able to do some things together. Looking forward to the movie night. Good popcorn, right, John? I like that. And then next week is going to be an interesting thing with the teens because... Uh, it's Senior Sunday, and so we'll, we'll be honoring the teens, but also they get to participate in the service. And uh, that's always an interesting time and a good thing to be able to see what they've learned and what they're able to do. And so I'm looking forward to that as well. We always have things going on here, and so it's very, very good to be able to watch and participate, and uh, I know you'll be involved in some of the things that are here. All right, so Mother's Day... I always like that because it's always such a positive thing. But we're going to start from a place I've never started from before. So the first time we're going to start is uh, this is not one of the people that you normally pick, but we happen to have her picture. This is Bathsheba. It was difficult to get her picture, I want you to know. And Bathsheba is not normally one of the mothers that we talk about on Mother's Day because she tended not to do things exactly the right way. Haven't you made some mistakes also? I think all of us have. But what happens when we make mistakes? A lot of times when we make mistakes, we become very judgmental of people who get caught with their mistakes. Not the ones who don't get caught, just the ones who do get caught. You should have been smarter and not gotten caught. That's not the right answer. All of us have things we do that are not right, and so she doesn't exactly start in the best place. First of all, she's married to a foreigner. That wasn't really supposed to happen either, but Uriah the Hittite is one of those people who's pretty impressive as well. He's one of the 30 mighty warriors of David. And so he is an impressive guy. 
as you read the story, you find out how credible he is and how much honor he has as he stands up for his, his king and as he is one of the men who will always do what's an honorable thing. But his wife, not so much. You know already probably the story about Bathsheba as she was taking a bath on her rooftop, which was a common thing. You can't see from the ground, but the king happens to have a tower in his palace, and so he stayed home, and he's up there, and she comes out, and she must have been a beautiful woman, even from a long ways off. Because he sees her from a long ways off, and it's not that there may not have been other ones out. It's, it's just, wow, that's impressive. And I think sometimes beautiful women have a very difficult time in life. And because the other ones didn't get that invitation, Bathsheba does. The king is calling for you. And so he asks who it is, and she comes and sure enough, one thing leads to another. They have sex together. She gets pregnant. Not always a good thing. Here we are, and now what do we do with all of this? It was just one night, and that's really all it takes. David decides he'll fix it, and so he basically commits murder by war, and Uriah the Hittite is, he dies. And so now she no longer is married, and he is free to take her as a wife, and uh, so he does. However, God reminds him through Nathan the prophet that that's not going to work either. So their first child dies. So here she is. She's married to a foreign man. She's had a child that's died. Her husband has been murdered. Now she's married to somebody else. This isn't an easy start. It's certainly not an easy thing to do with all of this. And so as you look at her and look at the things that she's had to go through, it seems to be pretty difficult for her. But as she marries David, the next son she has is named Solomon. And God likes Solomon. That always just kind of throws me a little bit because it's the one place where it said God loved him. The only time you see where it's written about a baby that way that God just loved him. She gave David four sons. And David makes a promise through God that Solomon would sit on the throne. God had refused to allow David to build the temple because he was a man with blood, partly because of Uriah as well, and that his son Solomon would build the temple, which means Solomon would need to sit on the throne. And so that's kind of the story of Bathsheba and where she is. And so... She's remarried. David has gotten much older. And he had several wives, and so they're not always in close contact. In fact, he has a girl with him, Abishag. And uh, so they don't always see each other. So she's been raising Solomon on her own almost as a single mom. Well, one of the other stories that's playing out at this time is Adonijah is one of David's other sons. Now, he's not the oldest son, but Absalom was already killed because he tried to take over the throne. And uh, he actually did drive David out, and so that David was no longer in charge of his kingdom or his palace. And then Absalom is killed. Basically, there's, there's kind of a, what do we do now? The king is getting older. Saul, the first king, didn't have an heir. David was chosen by God. Actually, Solomon is chosen by God. But Adonijah decides, I want to be king. I'm the heir. I'm the next one. I'm the next one in line. And uh, actually, he's the fourth son. And so he decides to campaign for it. He decides, I'm going to offer great sacrifices to God. I'm going to send people out to say, Adonijah is going to be king. And if you do enough press and if you do it the right way, then you're going to get your way with it, right? 
Well, at least that's the theory. And so that's kind of what he does. And he starts and everybody's saying, oh, Adonai just going to be king. Adonai just going to be king. It's just one of those things. It's very political in the way he goes about this. When you offer sacrifices, there's usually a feast involved with it. And so he invites all of these people to be able to come and to be able to be part of this whole sacrifice, except he does not invite Solomon. He does not invite Bathsheba. And so he doesn't invite everybody, just the political people, like Joab, the commander of the army. And so he wants him to be there, and Abiathar, the priest, he wants him to be there, but he's not going to invite Solomon. And then Nathan the prophet actually comes to Bathsheba about the promise that was made to her about Solomon being king. Why doesn't Nathan go? Why didn't he say something to David? Why didn't he say, no, you've got the wrong king? No, he comes to Bathsheba, the one with the reputation, the one that everybody knows, oh, she's the one who got caught. And now she is left with the knowledge. Your son should be king. She goes and begins to talk to David and says, you made a promise. My son would be king. So she goes to his chamber. Abishag is even there. And she says, you made a promise. But you don't realize what's going on in your own kingdom. Adonijah is doing all of the things that would allow him to be the next king. In fact, he's already willing to sit on the throne and already going to be there and be part of that. And you don't even see and understand. And if this happens, then Solomon and I are not going to be around much longer. We're going to be killed. So David says, no, I know that this is needing to be done. And so he makes the decree then that Solomon is going to be king. Well, Solomon is 10th in line as far as children. You wouldn't think of Solomon as being the next king. He's not even one of the oldest. He's not there. In fact, most of the scholars put his age between 12 and 20. So basically, he's a teenager. We'll split the difference and say he's 16. Okay, maybe 18, because then you're legal, right? Would we let somebody be president at 18? So she essentially walks into the national convention and says, wait a minute. I'm going to stop all of this political process that's going on, and I want you to make my son the king. That takes a lot, doesn't it? But she does that because God is the one who made the promise. God is the one who told David, you're going to let Solomon reign. And David doesn't argue. In fact, David then backs her up. She has to be willing to go and to say it and to demand it. You said this. God wants this. Because if we just let the world go of the way of the world, things don't always work out. But she stands up for her son. She stands up in the face of one of David's sons as a very rich man who's offered all these sacrifices, already has this great political influence, and she says, no, my son should be king. And sure enough, she works it out. Solomon is actually then put in place as king. And it is women like that that have such power behind them that when it comes to what God says and what God wants, that they have decided they are going to carry it out. They are going to make sure that it happens. It's incredible to watch how this works. The one thing you don't ever want to do in the wilderness is get between a mama bear and her cubs. Same is true with mom and her kids. It's just about as dangerous. And if she decides, this is what I want, she is going to make sure that that happens. There is no greater tribute that I know of than to point out the fact that some of these women that God has chosen have followed what God wants in such an incredible way 
that they have changed the world. Bathsheba, for all of her past, for all of her mistakes, for the fact that she commits adultery, for the fact that she gets caught, for the fact that she's pregnant, for the fact that now her husband is killed and she's got to be somewhat, you know, not saying, watch out for David, you're going to get killed. When she decides to turn to God and she decides, I'm going to live for him, she stays. And if there's ever an example of a woman who maybe didn't start out quite right and then decides, I am going to live for God and God blesses and God honors and God makes her one of those women who has raised a king on her own without that much interference from anybody else because there's lots of other sons growing up in that palace. He's 10th. Got no shot, right? But boy, he's got a mom who's with it. He's got a mom who understands all of this. He's got a mom who understands what it means to be able to follow God. You see, we tend to destroy people for their past. And we tend to look down on them. We think they don't deserve places of honor. And Bathsheba says, I'm going to have none of that. She is strong enough to insist on her son. Nathan the prophet is there, but he's not the one talking. All he says to her is, didn't somebody promise you? And she's the one that then goes to work. We cannot let the shame or our past make us not act for God. And when those two conflict, we know that God is the one who needs to win out. It's very clear with moms and children that moms fight for them, and Bathsheba raised one of the greatest kings of all of Israel. David was the warrior. Solomon is the statesman. Solomon is the one who made it rich. Solomon is the one who made all the treaties. Solomon is the one who negotiated all the trade routes. Solomon was one of the greatest leaders of all time. As you look at what he was able to accomplish, he's the rich one. He was able to lead them into greater prosperity than that nation will ever see again at any time. That's pretty impressive from a woman who didn't quite start so well, but one who decides when God speaks, I'm going to believe him and I'm going to make sure his word is carried out. And so God took special notice of Bathsheba and of Solomon. She did not let her past sins keep her out of the blessing of God. She raised a son as God's king. What an impressive fact it is to be able to realize that. So I think she's an example, one that we need to recognize, not one that we need to avoid. There's one more that I wanna to compare today. And that's Mary. Now, Mary we use a lot. Mary is the mother of Jesus. And so we understand Mary. She's not one who did anything wrong. And yet she finds herself almost in the same situation. And if you were not on the inside reading the book, but living with Mary, you're going to think exactly the same thing. What is God doing with all these women? Are you kidding? Now she's pregnant before she's married. I mean, she's got a guy that's going to marry her, but it hasn't happened yet, and you know how that is. Now she's pregnant. And so she's going to carry exactly the same shame as what Bathsheba did. She's going to have people who don't think she has done things right, even though she has, because the child that she carries is really the child of God, and it's one that the Holy Spirit has put there. So we know that Mary didn't sin like Bathsheba, but to the world it looks very much the same. Both got married after they dealt with the news of the pregnancy. Both continued in service to God and both stood by their children in very difficult situations. Mary was with Jesus during his ministry. She was the one who was there. She didn't see him all the time. Because he was traveling a lot, he had called disciples, and he was not always there. But uh, 
She was very special and important to him. One of the first miracles Jesus ever does is because of his mother. She calls him to a wedding where she must have had some part in the wedding and goes up to him and says, uh, they're out of wine. So, <laughs> he tries to say, my time isn't yet. But because it's for mom, he's the one who turns water into wine. The first miracle is for her. She has a tremendous influence with him. When Jesus goes to Nazareth, he's there to speak. He comes back to his hometown, and he even speaks in the synagogue, and they're so impressed with him. Wow, this is great. The carpenter's kid has grown up, and now he can quote Isaiah to us. And then Jesus kind of puts them down a little bit and says, you know, there's not many faithful people in Israel. In fact, God couldn't find any during the times of Naaman and Elijah, and they get mad. And she has to watch as her whole town turns against him. The town where he grew up, the town of Nazareth, where he was supposed to be, where he should be recognized as a great prophet. And yet that isn't what happens because they decide they're going to throw him off of a cliff, and so they grab him and they take him there, but somehow he escapes. And How much pride do you have then? A lot, because it's your child. Because he's the one who's right, even if the whole rest of the world is wrong. That's what's great about moms, that even if everybody else in the world is wrong, she's still going to believe in you. And you see two examples that do. She knew and she didn't know. There's an angel at his birth that announced amazing things. And she pretty much has to raise Jesus, at least in his later teenage years, on her own. Joseph is still there when he's 12, and he goes to the temple. And in that temple, he is left behind and stays behind. They don't know where he is. And as he comes back, they finally find him. He's in the temple. And it's, don't you know I had to be about my father's business? And from that time, it said Mary treasures things in her heart. She kind of keeps them. I'm not sure you know what to do with statements like that. But here he is. He's in the temple. I had to be about my father's business. Well, how do you argue with that? You shouldn't do that. Well, you can't say that. It's God's will. It's what God would want, and I need to be doing that. So certainly grace is extended for that, even if you break parents' rules. And so there they are, but Joseph is never heard from again after that. So by the time he's 30 and begins his ministry, it's, it's just Mary. And she watches the rise in popularity of all the things that happen, and she watches also the hatred of the rulers at that time and how they don't understand and how they disagree and how Jesus kind of on purpose says things to them to provoke them. He heals on the Sabbath. There's a man with a withered hand. There's a paralytic. He says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. That doesn't get him any points, does it? He's not playing the political games that everybody else would have done. He's no Adonijah. He's not trying to get to be king that way. And she watches as people begin to reject him. There's even one point where she comes to get him because everyone thinks he's crazy. And she and the brothers come and, you know, they're outside. They're waiting for you. And they've come because we think you're crazy. And we're going to take you home. And we're going to, we've got this little white padded room that we're going to put you in. And but that doesn't happen either. She wasn't in the garden. But she was at the cross. She was there to watch her son die. And she never gives up on him. He had not done anything wrong. And she's right there with him through it all. He's crucified between two criminals. 
In Matthew 27, 51, it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him kept keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. She sees what's going on. She sees all the hatred of the people, and it doesn't drive her away. But she can't get that close because there are too many other people around. She sees what's happening to her son, and then she sees what happens to the earth as they try to destroy him. And the earth begins to come apart. The earthquake begins, and there's darkness, and the rocks are split. That makes a huge sound. Earthquakes make a great big sound as well when the earth begins to tremble and to move on itself. And it's all about her son. And then the Bible adds this. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee when it was evening there came a rich man from Arimathea whose name was Joseph who also was a disciple of Jesus he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus and Pilate ordered it to be given to him and Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb which was cut in the rock and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and he went away and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. She has two other sons James and Joseph. And so when it says the mother of James and Joseph, it's talking about Jesus' mother. Because those were two of the names of the sons that he, she had after him. And then she's called the other Mary. Mary Magdalene is given as, you know, we get both names, which is very unusual. And the other Mary. And that's all it refers to her as the other Mary. And she's there. And that's what her name is. The other Mary. But she does not leave her son. She is there watching. And she's watching all this being done to him. And she watches all of the abuse that he suffers. And she knows how he believed. Because you can tell when your children really believe in something. You can tell how important it is, and it's the principle. She's there on purpose. Not in the front, but she's watching from a distance. And she has this treasure in her heart. It had started when he was 12, and he is still about his father's business. Did she, still, did she know that he still was? Watching him do God's plan. She had believed and was willing to go along with God's plan, even if it meant pregnancy and all of this shame that would come with that of not being married. And now all of a sudden you think it's pretty easy today. People don't think much about it. It's not a big deal. But back then it was huge. That just didn't happen. Even in my lifetime, I can remember when that was a practice that was not seen as something that was good. And to take it that far back, it would have really brought shame on any family. But she believed in him. She believed in God's plan. She says, I'll do whatever. There is no amount of shame that you can bring on me that I would not bear for God. 
And as she carries that out, she watches the shame that comes on her son as he's crucified as a criminal. And he says, there's no amount of shame I would not bear. Because I know what my mama did. That I would not do for the sake of God. She never doubted. Neither did he. Because she raised a king. She raised the greatest king of all of Israel and of all the world. And all the prophecies pointed to it. He would rule his people with a rod of iron. He was becoming that new king, but I'm not sure she really knew it at the time. She was there for the battle with evil. She was there sitting, watching, helpless, nothing she could do. As great punishment was given to her innocent child. And all of the anger and the hatred of the world came upon him. And when it was over, he was dead. And they took him to a tomb. And she watched as they placed him in the tomb. She couldn't even go to his tomb because there were guards there. That's my guess. We don't see a record of her being around the tomb. And so as soon as time permits and as soon as you see her able to go there in Matthew 28, it says, Now after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake and the angel of the Lord descended, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And that other Mary was the mother of Jesus. Mary was at the tomb with spices for her child, knowing that there's no amount of spice that's going to make this better. There's no amount of spice that's going to make it okay. And she felt the earthquake and she saw the angel and she saw that the tomb was empty and her son was gone. He's risen. And I have to think she believed. And she puts that as a treasure in her heart. That he's a man who will be about his father's business. And that's how she raised him. So that he would be strong enough to do that. What an incredible thing it is. What an incredible influence moms have in being able to raise great men who change the world. And they themselves change the world. And so today we still have people who are able to do this. She went and she watched and she saw and she's very often very helpless about it all because what else can she do? How else can she make this difference when there is no way she's got to have some kind of power, some kind of influence, and she doesn't. She's just mom. But you know, that's one of the greatest powers and influences ever. Because you see God respecting that and God carrying things out. And as she sits there as one of the faithful women, she sees, my son is gone. He is risen. She's one of the first ones. What an incredible joy that must have been as she comes back and says, no, he's not there anymore. What a horror it would have been to walk in and say, oh, there he is. I've got spice, but he's got a better gift for her. I've got resurrection. <laughs> what an incredible thing. And so moms today are able to see this and do this and raise their children in such a way that they can teach them about God. And they can show them what it means to be a child of God. And they can show them what it means to obey God. And sometimes they are so strong that when they read a promise of God in the Bible, they are going to live it out and they're going to raise their kids to live it out. And they're going to make sure that their kids know it 
and they're going to make sure that their kids are the ones that live it. What a tremendous thing. That's how it is. It's always true. The hand that rocks the tr cradle rules the world. And so today we give praise and honor to women of God. The rose doesn't do it. I know. But we do honor you today. Even if you've had a rough past, but you're with God now. Even if things didn't always go so smooth in your life. Even if things have been a little tough. Even if you've been through lots of criticism. Even if there are great sins that you have dealt with in the past. You are now with God. And your children will be with God. And God will respect them. And God will honor them. Because God forgives he never takes mama's sin and passes it on to a child. When she turns to God, when she lives for God, what an incredible life those kids are able to have because God empowers them to be great. And it's so odd how the kings of Israel seem to be that way. Solomon and Jesus both May God bless you and honor you today. And maybe you're still in the middle of it all. Maybe you're still struggling with that sin. And so maybe it's not over yet. And maybe you need to repent today. And you need to say, I want my child to be great. And so you're going to live your life for God. Even if there's been a bad past, God forgives and God blesses. And God says, I have got such promise for your kids if you just live for me. Maybe it's time to dedicate your life to him, and you haven't done that yet. We're here to honor you today, and what greater honor could that be than to turn your life over to God this morning? We would love to help you do that this morning. Would you come while we stand and sing?